Almost from the moment the bombs began to fall on Pearl Harbor, questions began to fall on the White House. Who knew what? And when did they know it? Until recently, those questions could not be answered. Was the surprise attack on the U.S. Naval Station at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, really a surprise? Why was the American fleet moved from the comparative safety of the West Coast just days before the attack? Did the Japanese Navy move across the Pacific in silence, or were their movements and intentions known days, perhaps even weeks, in advance? Perhaps the most disturbing question of all is, did President Franklin Delano Roosevelt not only know the attack was coming, but actually allow it in order to bring America into the war? We will begin our investigation with Pearl Harbor and see if we can penetrate the 60-year cloak of secrecy and intrigue when we come back. A mystery that cannot be explained. An enigma that defies reason. A surprising and unexpected answer. To encounter such a mystery firsthand may change your life forever. Face to face with the greatest riddles of the ages, the world's most profound mysteries reach out and touch your life in ways you never imagined possible. Extreme Mysteries. December 7th, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. Everyone knows that the Japanese Navy launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor in the early morning hours, destroying 21 ships, 347 planes, and roughly 2,400 people who were killed that morning. Another 1,200 were wounded. American servicemen and women, as well as civilians, all perished under the guns and bombs of the Imperial Japanese Navy. But were the Japanese the only ones guilty of deceiving the American people in that terrible incident? Is it possible that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was part of a scheme to save America from itself? The rest of the world was involved in conflict in the beginning of the 1940s. Germany had conquered most of Europe, and England was the last line of defense. FDR made no secret of the fact that he felt Germany and Adolf Hitler posed a significant threat to the security of the United States, but the American people wanted no part of the European war. The dilemma for President Roosevelt was very real. How could he get America involved in the war and put a stop to Adolf Hitler in the face of such strong popular opposition? Roosevelt did whatever he could to assist Churchill in the English war effort. Claiming that he was keeping the U.S. out of war, FDR persuaded Congress to pass the Lend-Lease Act, sending 50 World War I destroyers to England. American warships helped Allied supply convoys evade German U-boats. When this proved ineffective as a deterrent, and the Germans continued to sink many supply ships, the U.S. fired on and sank German U-boats. This constituted an act of war. If this fact had become public knowledge, Given his rather shaky popularity at the time, FDR could have been impeached and very likely convicted. During the Atlantic Conference in August 1941, Winston Churchill, who was the Prime Minister of Britain, sent a cable to his cabinet which was meant to give them encouragement. In it, Churchill said, FDR obviously was very determined that they should come in. It is clear that Roosevelt wanted the United States to be involved in the war, but that was not going to be an easy task given American public opinion. And since war had to be declared by an act of Congress, he needed a catalyst of some kind. In October of 1941, Secretary of the Interior Harold Ickes noted in his diary, for a long time I believed that our best entrance into the war would be by way of Japan. What's more, there was a time element. President Roosevelt believed that we needed to get into the war soon in order to stop Nazi domination of Europe. But how to convince the American public? Could he, as his Secretary of War suggested, use Japan to gain entry while everyone was focused on the war in Europe? Is it possible that President Roosevelt deliberately provoked the Japanese into attacking us? 
President Roosevelt and his advisors knew that they must change the views of the American public, and the best way to do that was to have Japan act as the aggressor against the United States. The Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, wrote in his diary that Japan needed to be seen as the aggressor if the American people were to be supportive of a war. In spite of the risk involved in letting the Japanese fire the first shot, we realized that in order to have the full support of the American people, it was desirable to make sure that the Japanese were the ones to do this so that there should remain no doubt in anyone's mind as to who were the aggressors. Arthur McCullum was an officer in naval intelligence who believed that war with Japan was inevitable. He developed an eight-point plan that, if followed, would lead to a Japanese attack on the United States. His plan was forwarded to two of FDR's most trusted military advisors. One of them endorsed the plan. But the paper trail ends there. There is no hard evidence that the president ever saw this plan. The question of whether President Roosevelt knew about this plan may be unprovable, but the record indicates he did, in fact, implement the steps outlined in the plan. The day after McCollum submitted his plan, President Roosevelt began to put the proposals into effect. Every one of the eight steps was eventually accomplished. Steps one and two were arranging with Britain and Holland for the use of bases on their islands in the Pacific. This amounted to a direct challenge to Japan since we were placing our ships in their backyard. Step three involved assistance to Chinese leader General Chiang Kai-shek in his battle with the Japanese. At the time, he was fighting against Japanese efforts to conquer China and make it part of the Japanese empire. Step four was to send a division of long-range heavy cruisers into Japanese territorial waters. This was a shocking decision on the part of the president. The deliberate decision to send warships into or close to Japanese territorial waters was extremely inflammatory. Roosevelt called these provocations prop-up cruises. He told advisors that he didn't mind losing one or two cruisers, but he did not want to take a chance on losing five or six. Meanwhile, Admiral Husband Kimmel, the Pacific Fleet commander at the time, strongly objected to these cruises. He told FDR that these cruises were ill-advised and would result in war with the Japanese. Step six was perhaps the most controversial of all the steps taken by FDR. McCollum's suggestion was to position the main strength of the U.S. fleet, then on the west coast, in the Hawaiian Islands. In April of 1940, large portions of the United States Navy joined warships from the Hawaiian detachment. The two groups were to join up for a training exercise. Admiral Richardson learned of the plan to position the fleet in Hawaiian waters instead of the west coast, and he strongly disagreed with it. He felt that Roosevelt was placing the fleet in harm's way, and he fought the move. Richardson later quoted FDR as saying, Sooner or later, the Japanese would commit an overt act of war against the United States, and the nation would be willing to enter the war. Could it be that moving the fleet to Hawaiian waters, as McCullum's plan suggested, was designed to invite an attack by Japan? Was the Pacific fleet being used as bait to entice the Japanese? In 1932, a Navy exercise demonstrated that Pearl Harbor was vulnerable to an air attack from carrier-based planes. The facility had serious shortcomings, which General Short and Admiral Kimmel tried to remedy. A major weakness was that there were never enough aircraft to provide air cover for a Navy base of this size and vulnerability. Pearl Harbor also lacked radar and trained personnel, both vital to protection against attack. The harbor entrance was so narrow that warships were forced to enter and exit in single file. This meant the warships would be a row of sitting ducks as they attempted to enter or leave the harbor. There simply was no logical reason to move the Pacific Fleet from the secure bases on the west coast to Pearl Harbor. The idea of moving the location of the fleet from the west coast to Pearl Harbor had actually begun five months before McCollum's plan was proposed. Admiral Richardson fought the idea for the entire five months, with FDR making no solid decision about the move. But Richardson lost the battle to keep the fleet on the west coast the day after McCollum's proposal was written. The final two steps of the plan involved cutting off the Japanese economy and military from needed supplies. We persuaded the British and Dutch governments to refuse Japanese requests for economic concessions, particularly oil. Following that, 
Both the United States and Great Britain imposed a complete embargo on all trade with Japan. Secretary of the Interior Harold Ickes wrote a memo to FDR in which he pointed out the possible results of the oil embargo on Japan. There might develop from the embargoing of oil to Japan such a situation as would make it not only possible, but easy to get into this war in an effective way. And if we should thus indirectly be brought in, we would avoid the criticism that we had gone in as an ally of communistic Russia. Japan's premier, Kanoi, had made various proposals for peace, each of which was spurned by FDR. This led to the inevitable replacement of Kanoi by General Tojo, who pledged to do whatever was necessary to break the economic blockade and stranglehold the U.S. government had inflicted on the nation of Japan. On November 26, 1941, Secretary of State Cordell Hull issued an ultimatum to the Japanese government. This ultimatum called for the complete withdrawal of Japan from Indochina and all of mainland China. Admiral Kimmel and General Short were ultimately blamed for the surprise at Pearl Harbor. But were they responsible? Were these commanders deliberately kept out of the intelligence loop and then made the scapegoats? Did our government deliberately provoke the Japanese government into war and then cover up their part in this treachery? New information on what many believe is a 60-year-old conspiracy when we return. Extreme Mysteries The ultimatum of November 26 appears to have been the straw that broke the camel's back. President Roosevelt's ambassador to Japan called this the document that touched the button that started the war. Was that what the president wanted? Did he take such a harsh stand knowing it would push the Japanese government into attacking the United States? Basically, Roosevelt orchestrated events so Japan would have no option but to declare war. Each of McCollum's eight points was meant to threaten either Japan's security or its economy. Roosevelt had the objective of getting into the war, and he got what he wanted. An absolute essential in any discussion of Pearl Harbor concerns the Japanese codes and the U.S.'s ability to break them. U.S. government officials say that we did break the Japanese diplomatic code, the so-called Purple Code, which allowed us to read their diplomatic messages. But the Japanese naval code was more difficult, and according to official government reports, this code was not broken until well after the Pearl Harbor attack. That, of course, is the official version. It can be unpleasant, but we must ask a difficult question here. Is this official version simply one put out by those who were involved in deceiving the American public, or do the facts back it up? Captain Safford, the chief of communications intelligence, said that from December 1, 1941, we had the Japanese code solved to a readable extent. Winston Churchill wrote, from the end of 1940, the Americans had pierced the vital Japanese ciphers and were decoding large numbers of their military and diplomatic telegrams. Recent evidence has shown that we were reading the Japanese naval codes long before Pearl Harbor. Rear Admiral Royal Ingersoll, the Assistant Chief of Naval Operations, revealed our ability to read the Japanese codes in a letter dated October 4, 1940. He wrote to Admiral Richardson and Admiral Hart, who were the two Pacific commanders, and stated that Navy cryptographers had solved the Japanese naval merchant ship code. The system itself, Ingersoll told them, is 99% readable. In November and December 1941, President Roosevelt was personally briefed twice a day on Japanese Navy messages by his aide, Captain John Burdell. FDR also demanded to see the original raw messages in English. To this day, 60 years later, our government still refuses to identify or declassify any pre-December 7, 1941 military decoded messages on the basis of national security. The only reason that makes any sense for such secrecy is to distance the American government and President Roosevelt from foreknowledge of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Are these scandalous questions merely an attempt to discredit FDR and nothing more? Historians have said that the Japanese fleet maintained complete radio silence while they were en route to Pearl Harbor. So what messages were there to decode? At least that's the story we've been told for the past 60 years. But is it the truth? Did the Japanese Navy maintain complete radio silence? The idea of radio silence is nothing more than a myth created at the time and maintained to the present. 
There were 129 Japanese naval intercepts obtained by the U.S. Naval Monitor Stations between November 15th and December 6th, 1941. These were all found in the records of the National Archives. These messages came from Admiral Nagumo, commander of Japan's carrier fleet. They came from the government in Tokyo. They came from the individual aircraft carriers, division commanders, and from other ships in the fleet. We have copies of these messages, and I have found and spoken with the radio operators who intercepted and recorded them. On December 1, 1941, the tanker Syria radioed to the rest of the strike force, proceeding to a position 30 degrees north, 154.20 east, expect to arrive at that point on 3 December. The fact that this message is in the National Archives destroys the myth that the attack fleet maintained radio silence. We have proof that over 663 messages were sent between November 16th and December 7, 1941. The messages are now part of the official record. One message that was intercepted refers to the attack on Hawaii at least twice. From here, things get hazy. No one admits to having seen the actual message and all the intercepts have been declared top secret. Could it be that no one read the message that was intercepted naming Hawaii as the target? Or is the truth even more shocking? Some historians relate a similar incident involving Winston Churchill. The British had deciphered the German code used to order bombing raids over England. On November 14, 1940, a German signal was deciphered that named the city of Coventry as the target for that evening's bombing. Churchill faced a dilemma. If he ordered the evacuation of the city, the Germans would know that their code had been broken and the code would have been changed. As a result, he sacrificed the city of Coventry and over 500 innocent people were killed that night. Was FDR thinking that the sacrifice of Pearl Harbor was necessary for the greater good of the nation and the world? And if so, did he have the right to make that decision for the 2,400 people who died in the attack? Even if no one read the intercepted messages naming Hawaii as the target, there were plenty of other warnings given. The Peruvian ambassador to Tokyo sent a message to our embassy in Tokyo. He stated that he had heard from numerous sources that Japan planned to attempt a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. This message was passed on by our embassy to Secretary of State Cordell Hull. Even with the climate of the times, it is still a mystery why no one bothered to take this message seriously. An agent for the Sino-Korean People's League met with Senator Guy Gillette of Iowa and convinced him that the Japanese were planning to attack Pearl Harbor in December or January. The agent told Senator Gillette that they had positive proof of the coming attack, including an eyewitness to the plans. The senator personally alerted the State Department, Army and Navy Intelligence, and President Roosevelt. The U.S. government received various warnings of the impending attack. There is now extensive evidence that they knew what was coming. By November 14, 1941, Roosevelt knew that war would come if diplomatic negotiations were unproductive. On November 22, 1941, Tokyo advised its special envoy to the United States that if an agreement was not reached with the U.S., the deadline absolutely cannot be changed. After that, things are automatically going to happen. He was told to expect a surprise aggressive movement by Japan, but not to place the fleet in a position that would initiate Japanese action. Washington clearly knew that Pearl Harbor was the target. They removed the aircraft carriers from Pearl Harbor. The commander of the Air Force, Hap Arnold, was commissioned to send 13 planes to Pearl Harbor to arrive exactly the same time as the Japanese attack at 8 a.m. And Admiral Kimmel's orders were to keep only his oldest vessels inside Pearl Harbor. He sent 21 modern warships, including his two aircraft carriers, west toward Midway and Wake Islands. The orders also included stripping Pearl Harbor of 50 planes, almost 40% of its fighter protection. The two aircraft carriers, the USS Lexington and the USS Enterprise, were sent out from Pearl Harbor a week before the attack. They were supposed to deliver Army pursuit planes to Wake Island and Midway. The Enterprise did deliver planes, but the Lexington simply sailed around in the Central Pacific and never delivered any planes. 
Why were these task groups sent out on this meaningless exercise? What was left in Pearl Harbor when the attack came were the old relics of World War I. Our fastest and most modern ships just happened to have been ordered out of Pearl Harbor before the attack. The final evidence that we were aware of the coming attack was a Japanese message that was intercepted in the early morning hours of December 7th. This message was supposed to have been delivered to the State Department at 7.30 a.m. Hawaiian time. The paper trail of this intercept is fully documented in Navy files. At around 5 a.m. Hawaiian time, or 10 in the morning, Washington time, the intercepted message was delivered to President Roosevelt. This message stated that Japan was cutting off all diplomatic ties with Washington. They were declaring war. There was a one o'clock deadline which gave FDR around three hours to warn all of his military people, including Pearl Harbor. What did the president do? He did nothing. The fact that Roosevelt did nothing is incredible. An earlier Japanese message intercept had prompted him to say, this means war, and yet he did nothing to warn the commanders at Pearl Harbor. Navy officials in Washington delayed sending any warnings to any areas that desperately needed to know what was happening. When the warnings were finally sent to Pearl Harbor, they were deliberately sent by the slowest possible means, and this was only meant to be a face-saving gesture. Why did the president and other military officials delay warning Admiral Kimmel at Pearl Harbor? Certainly, Japan needed to be seen as the aggressor if FDR were to convince the public that war was the proper course. But wouldn't the attack have had the same effect if our personnel had been ready for it? Could it be that President Roosevelt wanted an especially heinous act to motivate the nation toward war? Rear Admiral Robert Theobald was the commander of the Pacific Fleet's destroyers at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack. He later wrote a book explaining, in his view, how FDR manipulated events in order to bring the United States into the war to stop Germany. Did Washington remain silent to deliberately facilitate the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor? Or did they, in reality, not know about it? Immediately after Pearl Harbor was attacked, Congress began to question the administration's failures to prevent the attack. The official stand was Admiral Kimmel and General Short were the only ones responsible for the mess at Pearl Harbor. But their indictment was only a small part of the attempt to keep the truth of what happened on December 7, 1941, from the American people. Rear Admiral Lee Noyes, the Navy's Director of Communications, instituted a censorship policy that placed all pre-Pearl Harbor Japanese military and diplomatic intercepts and all other relevant documents into Navy vaults. Then he told a group of his subordinates, destroy all notes or anything in writing. In 1945, two weeks after Japan had surrendered, the Navy blocked public access to any pre-Pearl Harbor message intercepts. They classified all the documents as top secret. Even Congress was unable to see these documents. Fleet Admiral Ernest King threatened imprisonment and loss of Navy benefits to any Naval personnel who gave information about the success of the code-breaking program. Only a fraction of the American public knows the truth about who is responsible for Pearl Harbor. Chief Warrant Officer Ralph T. Briggs confirmed that he intercepted the message that Japan declared war. He even located a Navy memo buried in the records that indicated he had read the message as early as December 4, 1941. And Captain Lawrence Safford was the main officer connected to this issue who had the courage to confirm that there had indeed been such a message about the Japanese plans forwarded to Washington before the attack. Isn't it odd that at the congressional hearings, Briggs was ordered by his superior officers not to testify and not to have anything further to do with Captain Safford. Did Franklin Delano Roosevelt or someone in his administration silently permit the events at Pearl Harbor to take place even though they could have been prevented? Perhaps we will never know. But we do know the price of that silence proved to be 2,326 lives. <laughs>